What's happening, everyone? Welcome to episode two of the Punch Perfect podcast brought to you by The Neutral Corner. If you're new to the podcast, I'm the host, Jamie Bourne, the lead editor and founder of The Neutral Corner. Um, Before we get into today's episode, I just wanted to issue a quick thank you to everyone who listened, shared and interacted with the first episode. We've all been overwhelmed by the support and we're glad everyone enjoyed it. Uh, Moving forward, the podcast will be available on YouTube and Podbean. Um, If you're on the mood, Uh, on the move out and about podbean is a really useful app it's free to download on ios or android and you can listen to the podcast for three free on there Um, but if you're in home comforts youtube might be the way forward for you jumping into today's episode i'm delighted to welcome back charlie griffiths charlie how we doing mate yeah all good thanks for having me back again mate no worries. Enjoyed having you on the first one. And today we're joined by a good friend of mine, someone that used to spend hours talking to in sixth form about boxing, a good good friend of mine, Usman. Usman, how are you doing, mate? I'm uh, good, Jamie, bro. Pleasure to, pleasure to be here. Yeah, it's good to have you on. Uh, so we'll get cracking straight into the first topic. Um, and we're looking at who are the best trainers in boxing today? I'll put the question out there to the guys who is currently the best trainer in boxing. Obviously, that's hard because you're kind of relying on your fighters' performances. So Mm -hmm. we're kind of looking at guys that are in the conversation of being the best trainer. Um, So we'll go to you, Usman, first uh, to throw you in at the deep end straight away. Who do you consider to be one of the best trainers in boxing at the minute? So I actually, I was thinking about this question beforehand. And I was trying to, you know, go through my head and thinking about, okay, who's the best trainer? I was coming up with names like, you know, you have your usual and also, I don't know, Coldwell, all those guys. Really should... And someone who popped into my mind was actually Calvin Ford. And not more so for what he's achieved as a trainer. You know, he's done okay with Javante Davis, fair enough, but more so what he's done away from boxing. You know, coming up, growing up in Baltimore, um, not just Baltimore, but the most deprived area of Baltimore. And, you know, to actually, I'm not sure if you guys are familiar with the TV show, The Wire. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Dennis Cutty Wise, Coach Cutty, was actually based on Calvin Ford. And oh, really? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm not sure if you guys knew that. Um, Coach Cutty was actually based on Calvin Ford. So if you go through his fighters' Instagram page, you'll see them. Coach Cutty, this, that. Um, he actually went to prison in the late 80s for racketeering and you know, what, he, he did what he had to do to survive. And upon coming out, he learned to box in prison. And I feel like it's amazing what he's done, taking fighters off the streets. Well, not, not, not more so fighters, but taking the youth off the streets, throwing them into boxing gyms. Because his gym works in such a way that um, he, it will be closed during the day because obviously the nightlife in Baltimore is crazy. And the gym will open at night. And it, over time, it became like a safe haven for fighters to go to. And to be fair to sorry, Coach Cutty, um, Calvin Ford, he's done well with, I feel like he's done well with, with Javante Davis. And he's also got a couple other fighters coming through, such as, um, I actually spoke to Jamie about this the other day, uh, Lorenzo Simpson, super middleweight. So it's seven and no four KOs. He's quite, he's one to keep an eye on. And there's also an upcoming amateur from the gym as well, McKinley Fulton. Um, and obviously along with Javante Davis, they're the three that I feel like he's got his eyes set on. So, yeah, for me, I think Calvin Ford stands out more so, again, for what he's done outside of boxing. Which, you know, it's a big factor for me. But I look at you know, trainers who want to make an that's impact. An I- yeah, that's an interesting one because I kind of didn't expect uh, kind of all the names that I had in my mind and I didn't <laughs> yeah, make yeah, my yeah. own notes. Mm. I really didn't expect that to come out. Um, yeah, yeah. I wasn't, I wasn't aware of kind of his backstory. I knew, obviously, the work he was doing with Javante yeah. Davis. Yeah. Um, and I, I knew being from Baltimore that he probably was from a kind of impoverished background. Yeah, yeah. Um, Charlie, who's someone that you, if you were to kind of counteract the argument almost and throw another name in the mix, who, who's your pick? So like the pair of you, it was certainly the sort of, in my notes, the thing that sort of really set me back today. It took me hours to kind of come up with a pitch for one person because, as you say, there's always an argument about is it the trainer that's, you know, that, that throughout the years you've had trainers that have been sort of given all the credit for, um, for, for a fighter and then some that sort of get no credit at all. Um, you know, so it, it's been hard. The name I came, the name I eventually landed on was um, Sh- uh, Shinjo Inoue. Um, and 
it was more it was more not that I think he's necessarily the best trainer, but the interest in the debates about nature and nurture and you know the fact is you know his his son that he's that he's looking after and his son isn't just he's not just a sort of run of the mill you know um boxer he's, he's he's now seen as this monster this you know taking over the world and hit so hard for his weight and no one wants to get in with him no one can stand toe to toe with him and you know all right that's changed slightly after the nair fight but there's this whole sort of hype around um you know at the minute that I was taking a look at his dad and I just find that I think the the sort of topic of nature and nurture is is quite interesting. Um, and I feel like if there was a case study on on nature and nurture that, that like, that I don't know if we have any sort of science, scientists listening to this show out of all the people that did listen, but it would be quite interesting for them, for them to look at, at Inu's dad to kind of work yeah. out because in a way he's, he is both, the nature and the nurture part of him. But I was reading a story about him not so long ago, actually, after it was when he, in, in his fight uh, with Manny Rodriguez, he was, um, he was, uh, he was in the press because obviously there was that whole shoving thing and stuff. And Inoue said that he, he punished Rodriguez for touching his dad and stuff like that. And um, I read a story about him that he was saying he used to be a boxer himself, but he sort of gave it up. But when, when Inoue was four, he could see that he wanted to box. I mean, as a four-year-old, I don't know how he saw that. And he has sort of coached him and taught him into being this beast that, um, yeah, I just, I just found that story quite interesting that I know he's not the first father, tra- uh, father-son father trainer of all time, but just the way people see Inoue and see, uh, you know, that the way he boxes, how hard he hits and stuff like that, that, it's just quite an interesting story behind him. And obviously he's got the other boy as well, I know who recently lost, but was also really, really highly rated um, out in Asia. Um, so yeah, yeah, there, there's my option. Yeah, that's a good one. I, um, I'm i actually following a similar theme and I wasn't, I was going to kind of continue what you just said, but I'm actually going to throw it onto my argument now because it's, it relates to yours, and I went for a father-son kind of dynamic as well. And I went for Papachenko, uh, Anatoly Lomachenko. Um, kind of, you see what he's done, and he's not the sort of, you know, some trainers constantly work with great fighters. You've got, you know, you've got great trainers like Freddie Roach and people like that that works with countless great fighters over sort of like different periods of time. Um, and they take them at different points in their careers, and it's not necessarily from the ground upwards. But you look at the work that Anatoly's done with his son Vasil, it's just incredible the way he took him through that amateur system in Ukraine and only losing a fight. And he's in that Ukrainian amateur system, he also worked with Yusik and Vozdik, who we mentioned in the last episode. Um, and between them, they had a combined amateur record of 951 wins with just 46 defeats. <laughs> and when, when you think of that, I mean, that's pretty crazy. And when since Anatoly's moved away from the Ukrainian amateur setup and Vasil and Alexander have gone pro, um, the amateur setup hasn't been as prolific. They've got a good middleweight at the minute that looks promising. But apart from that, they're kind of being overtaken by the Kazakhstans and the Uzbekistans of the world. Um, but you see the work he's doing. You mean, you look at Lomachenko and Yusik. I mean, that's two of the, in my opinion, two of the top three in boxing at the minute. And it could be two of the top five, depending on what your list is. And you see the way those guys operate. I mean, you're never going to see fighters like that again. And if you do, it's not going to be for a very, very long time. And what's intriguing about it is his his kind of weird training methods i mean if you've watched you know in these pre-fight build-ups you see videos of lomachenko and music training and you know they're they're juggling tennis balls and they're dancing yeah. around the gym and they're catching coins off their forehead and things like this they're just doing weird things that other fighters aren't doing and to the level he's got them to it's really interesting just to see that that speaks a lot of him that he's managed to get them to to that level from a young age as well um he hasn't just taken them on, obviously, at 
at a certain point where they've already achieved a lot and they look to be a certain level, he's taken them to that level and they keep churning out these great victories. Um, and a, another point that really kind of stands out for me is that Gassiev fight. Kind of, Usyk has kind of, um, Anatoly's always been there in the background, but Usyk has worked with other people as well when he turned pro um, due to kind of Anatoly's schedule with Loma. And he brought him back in for the Gassia fight. And you just see the way he performed in that fight. It's like, wow, a lot of the credit goes to Usyk, but also I think Anatoly played a bigger part in that than people think. Um, are there any other kind of father-son dynamics you think in boxing that have worked as well as either Inoue and his uh, father or Lomachenko and his father? I mean, I don't think when we talk direct, like a blood relationship between father and son, but... I- now you mentioned that, I tend to think of the fighters out of the crunk gym. So Manny Stewart and his guys. Yeah. More so like, obviously in the 90s, you know, he had 80s, 90s, Hearns, Gerald McClellan, the Klitschkos, Lennox Lewis. And every time I saw uh, Manny Stewart with these guys, I felt like it was as close as you could get to a father and son relationship. Yeah. So, yeah. And also, Mike Tyson, Customato. Simple. That's, that's the most obvious one that stands out. Because it was so obvious as soon as Cus passed away, Tyson's, it just went all pear shaped for him. Yeah, he was never quite the same after never that relationship same. ended. That, that was the relationship I was sort of alluding to when, when you sort of, you hear some people sort of dedicate a whole career to a trainer. You know, they sort of, they, they believe that without this trainer, they're not even the same, you know, yeah, the same yeah. fighter anymore. And and, uh, and then other trainers sort of, uh, I remember the, the, uh, Groves um, Frotch first fight, and uh, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. and obviously you know Groves had to change trainer right at the last minute and kind of you know said, well I'm doing it all by myself anyway. You know he sort of he was he was almost like like I, d- I don't need a trainer. I've sort of got a trainer there because I have to have a trainer. You know so yeah. And then and obviously this um, Joe and Enzo uh, from years oh, back that had yeah. father and son relationship as well. Yeah, that's a that, that's a good one, Charlie. Because it, I mean, reflecting on that, say something happened. Obviously, Enzo's not with us anymore, sadly. But you know, say something happened during Joe's career where Enzo wasn't in the picture anymore, and it was mentioned a few times that they were going to split because there was a bit of kind of animosity there. Would Joe, would Joe have been able to compete at the same level? Would he be able to go back to that corner at the end of a round and truly trust what the man in front of him was saying? Do you think? kind of those father-son relationships are so important for for that kind of support system, not necessarily for the knowledge they're giving you, but just for having someone you truly trust. Yeah, I think definitely. I think, I think you know, we, we sort of spoke about it <clears throat> last week, even when we played our parents the podcast for the first time, you know, and then hearing yeah. their, them sort of praise, the praise it is always when a parent's sort of there and telling you you've done well and stuff, it's always it always seems to mean that little bit more. So I'm sure there is something in that. Yeah. I think with the the three names that we've mentioned, I think we've kind of gone not too far out the picture, but we've kind of, we've left a lot of names out that could be mentioned. Yeah. Going back round to you, Usman, is there anyone that you kind of, you know, you're kind of surprised we haven't mentioned yet or someone that is clearly, obviously kind of one of the best in the world right now? Yeah, so um, like I said, I was going to say Eddie Reynoso simply because of work he's done so he's like he's taken these Mexican so much to say brawlers and he's turned them into like technical fighters and it's evident with the likes of Canelo um, uh, Oscar Valdez recently uh, Brian Garcia of course um, and to be fair to Eddie Reynoso he's done well with these fighters in the sense that they're all world champions as well yeah you know they're all world champions and they're not just just world champions. These are elite Mexican fighters. Because I feel like with Reynoso, he's changed the dynamic of what the modern Mexican fighter should be. Because back in the day, when we were younger, it was always, you know, you had the Pereira, Morales, um, Marquez, all those guys. They'd love a toe-to-toe war. Mexican pressure style, as they call it, Mexican style. But I feel like, again, since Reynoso's come in, um, the example I'm going to use is Oscar Valdez. Like, I used to look at Oscar Valdez and... It's a style that used to appeal to me, you know, used to load up on every punch. I don't know, you know, the stamina work rate was un- unbelievable. But I've noticed that his last couple of fights, but since he's taken taken um, 
Eddie Renoso on board. It's a much more refined and technical style. And I always feel that's the best way forward. You know, it's, it's, it's boxing, not fighting. So <laughs> you have to appreciate the art, which is why I always tend to go with trainers and fighters who are, tend to stick to the basic principles and fundamentals. Yeah. Yeah, when you said Eddie Reynoso, kind of that was the name I expected to be mentioned yeah, first. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I, I, I actually kind of avoided him as my pick because I, I assumed someone else was going to bring him up at some point. He's kind of one of those trainers. He's building an impressive stable. Obviously, he's got um, Canelo, he's got Brian Garcia, he's got even Lewis Neri uh, oh, yeah, um, yeah, yeah. at um, Bantamweight. He's got uh, Cesar Martinez at Flyweight. And recently, he's added Andy Ruiz, which is an interesting move. Um, Charlie, what do you what do you make of that? I know, kind of. I watched an interview either yesterday or the day before, listening to Manny Robles, and it was actually quite. Um, it was gutting to hear him how devastated he was. Uh, you know, he had a guy in the biggest fight of his career against Anthony Joshua, and he just didn't try, and it reflected badly on him. But it really wasn't his fault. It was Ruiz's lack of dedication. Do you think? Um, Eddie Renoso will be able to turn the screw in his head or do you just think it's a personal thing with Ruiz? Look, Ruiz won the lottery, didn't he? He, um, you know, even the way he sort of, he's, he almost pride, prides himself on, you know, he, like there was more stories about Ruiz buying mansions and chains and all the rest of it. And, and look, there's obviously, there was obviously that's because that's a, a, a funny story for them to tell. but. The, the, how he came into that second fight, because the, the whole build-up to the Joshua fight, and they were asking him, oh, you've got lots more tattoos now and stuff, you know, just ridiculous <laughs> questions that had nothing to do with anything. But, I, and I thought, do you know what? I really hope he sort of shows come fight night. So what if I bought myself a nice house, a nice car, some nice jewellery? I can still get in and I can still hang with, you know, the top fighters. It wasn't a lucky shot. And then you watch it and, and it, it sort of makes you think, ah, he did just sort of give up. He did give up on it. But having said that, this move, uh, it seems a serious move. It seems like it seems like maybe he did mess about. Maybe he didn't take it too seriously. Maybe thought maybe just genuinely thought he had the beating of Joshua. You know, I, it, it, the moment you take someone out like that, you you must believe in your mind. It's why, without going off the subject too much, it's why. When after Fury beat Wilder for the second time and Wilder called on his rematch and you saw everyone saying, why is he bothering? Because he he knows without actually beating Fury, he knows he can pretty much take him out because he's already pretty much done it. You know, once apart from this miraculous recovery, he, yeah. he took him out. So and I think once you do that to someone once, you have got belief in your head. I can do it again. And there's belief in the other guy's head. He can do that again to me, you know. So, yeah. um, so maybe he just maybe he didn't try hard enough in that second Joshua fight. I, I don't know what it was, but the move the move's an interesting one, and the the move sort of suggests he's serious. I don't think he would be allowed to go there and you know just to mess around and stuff. I, I feel like the move seems serious, and there's still some fights for him. You know, there's there's some fights around that division that. I wouldn't mind seeing Ruiz in, so yeah, I, I think it's a, I think it's a good move, and I think I think like I feel like the move suggests, and obviously could be proved wrong, but suggests he's he's still serious. Yeah, yeah. I, I, agree. I agree. He um kind of if you're not if you are not serious about about your career, you're not gonna you team up with one of the best trainers in the world, yeah. um and. Like you said, he's still in the mix. You know, he um, at heavyweight, there's fights um, against the kind of guys that are just outside the top. You know, the Joshua, the Fury, the Usyk, the Wilder, just outside that level. You know, the White and the Parkers and everything. You can make a lot of money fighting those guys, and if you're good enough to beat them, you get the bigger fights. So I think it's a good move for him, and I think it will put him back in the mix, and there'll be some exciting fights. Um, Charlie, going back to you, was there, because we asked Usman about whether there was someone that we'd missed and he came out of Eddie Reynoso, was there, was there another name that you thought maybe someone might suggest? Uh, I'm not sure about what someone would suggest or necessarily think is the best trainer, but I've always liked Shane McGuigan. Yeah, I was going to say the same thing. Yeah, he, 
sometimes he gets a bit stick online, and I, I think it's a bit harsh. I think he, I think what he's really good at is he adapts to his fighter quite well. So whoever the fighter is, because he's had some sort of, he teamed up with Hay for a little while, you know, and he's sort of become, he became David David Hay's mate. Do you know what I mean? Whereas when he was with Frampton, for example, he and and like the, the build up to the Quig fight, he almost became Northern Irish. Do you know what I mean? He became yeah. one of them. He really embedded himself in that in that belief. There's obviously something going on there where, you know, Frampton, Taylor, Taylor, yeah, T- Taylor has left him now, hasn't he? Yeah, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. T- Taylor's with Ben Davidson now. Yeah. Yeah, so th- th- I-, I think there is clearly something that goes on there. I don't know if it's more his dad or whatever, um, but yeah, as a trainer, I think he's I think he's really decent. I feel like he he really he really does adapt to his fighter well. Um, not perfect, but he's still young and, and and he looks young as well. He looks quite fresh and sort of up and coming. And so th- his mistakes you can sort of. Because it's like when you see Joe Gallagher still making the same mistakes, he sort yeah. of becomes a bit irritating, you know. And but when when McGuigan does it, I don't know. There's something young and fresh about him, and he just seems like like he could really. And 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 look, he's he's had Groves there with him, Hay, Frampton, Taylor. He's had some some really solid names, you know, that have gone and asked him to train him. So he's obviously doing something right. Yeah, I think that was I, he was someone that I was going to suggest. Um, I've kind of for a long time I've always felt that Adam Booth was kind of the best trainer in the country, and then the way Shane McGuigan's come along, I think right now he's that's that's his kind of title. He, um, when you're just saying about how young and fresh he is, when you look at some of the wins he's guided his fighters to, and don't get me wrong, first and foremost the fighters have to put in the performance. But you look at the kind of fights that he was behind. You know, you look recently, I was really impressed with his work with Josh Taylor in the pro Grow fight. Yeah. I thought the advice he gave him kind of won him the fight in the in the second half where kind of he gave, made him, suggested those adjustments. And then you look at the other wins, like, you know, people forget he was with Frampton when he beat Santa Cruz, which was one of the kind of sort of big British wins overseas. Um, he was with Groves when he beat Chudanoff. Um even Luke Campbell, you know, he lost thoroughly to Lomachenko, but I don't think he could have been any better prepared. Yeah. I think that that is as good as he could have given that night. And I think he really kind of um, got him in the best possible position. And even another one kind of to the lower level that he's worked with, even Lawrence Acoli, a kind of we all criticise him and he isn't good to watch. And I do think as he moves up the levels, he will get found out. He... McGuigan's just telling him to do the right things. He's not trying to make him some flashy boxer. He's, he knows he's awkward and he's telling him to be awkward because it gets in the wins. And I think he's doing a really good job. And like you said, with him being young, he's only going to develop. Um, but I do think you're right. I think the kind of Barry involvement might be having an effect on his relationship with fighters, sadly. Um, it kind of it's a shame we don't know more about what actually happened with Taylor and um, stuff like that. Um, a name I wanted to throw out there to you, Usman, um, someone that kind of for a while, and he's won trainer of the year a couple of times. Um, and back in the day, he worked with Terry Norris and his brother and he's worked with some really good champions over the years. Um, he was at the forefront of the Gennady Golovkin camp until, uh, last year when they split Abel Sanchez. Do you think, do you still hold him as one of the best trainers or do you think he, he may be, you know, he had a bit of luck on his side having a good fighter like Golovkin, or do you think he is genuinely one of the best in the world? See, Abel Sanchez was a name that I was thinking about putting out there when you mentioned the question to me. And I looked at Abel Sanchez and I think to myself, all right, you just mentioned fighters have, um, if, uh, sorry, trainers have a stable of fighters to which they train. And when you think to Abel Sanchez, the first thing, the first fact that comes to mind is, okay, unless you know who Terry and Orlin Norris are, it's always Gennady Golovkin. Um, other than that, I can't really think of anybody else who's trained. I mean, I do remember he trained um, uh, Franz, Franz Bota, heavyweight, South African in the 90s. Uh, he didn't go on to achieve much, but to be fair to him, it was a decent name to train. And I do think when it comes to Abel Sanchez, other than Terry Norris and Golovkin, there hasn't really been, and I don't know recently, did Joe Joyce go out to work with him? Or is that still a yeah, running partnership? 
no, not anymore. But Joyce has was there. He's kind of bounced around with everyone, it seems. Yeah. So with again comes down to styles with Abel Sanchez. I feel like Golovkin had the tailor made style for Sanchez to you know adapt and throw in his own little his own little magic on Golovkin. Um, again, like I mentioned before, Mexican fighters and Sanchez is obviously Mexican trainer. So it's like he's kind of bought Golovkin from. He's, he's, he's adapted a Kazakh into a Mexican style because yeah. I'm going to throw the question out there to you guys. When you think Mexican style, for me, Golovkin is the first one that comes to mind. And I'm not sure if it's the same for, for you guys. If I was thinking of potentially of maybe a non-Mexican, then yeah, yeah, of course. I, 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 I could see that. Um, I'd have to think about it more when it comes to a non-Mexican, but I do think Golovkin kind of has that 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 kind of Mexican style, and like you said, it is bred from Sanchez. Kind of, you yeah, see of Sanchez yeah, yeah, worked yeah. with him and that. Um, Charlie, did you have a kind of an answer for that question? Uh, yeah, I, I get what you mean. I, I do think that's also, you know, Golovkin makes a big thing about the Mexican style. Even even that term, he likes to tell people about Mexican style. He said it quite a few times there. I think he. I think that was what his whole sort of catchphrase was in the build-up to the Canelo fight as well. Um, but yeah, it's an interesting question. Would I necessarily think Golovkin straight away when thinking Mexican style? He would be, yeah, I suppose he would be one of one of the first few names that would come up if I was trying to explain Mexican style to someone. Um, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Golovkin is probably someone that I would show him as a you know, as long as they didn't have to see his name, because I think that would add confusion into <laughs> how can someone call Gennady Golovkin his, his, his Mexican style. But yeah, in terms of like the way he fights, it would be it would be an example I would use for sure. Good stuff. Um, before we move on to the next topic, there was something that came into my mind when I was thinking of trainers. Um, earlier this year, we lost Roger Mayweather who kind of spent a lot of time in Floyd's corner over his career, more more time than his own father, actually. He um, And he was kind of one of the best trainers and someone that worked really well for Floyd. And since that loss, kind of Floyd has kind of been inspired to take up a career in training himself. And when I first heard the move, I, kind of, I wasn't fully on board with it. I, I sometimes think if you're that great, it kind of struggles to translate to people that aren't as good as you and you can become frustrated. But over the past week or so, he's been spending a lot of time with Devin Haney. And I like what I see with that. And I think if he can get fighters like that, someone that, I mean, when you watch Haney, it's like he's trying to emulate that pretty boy Floyd. Mm. Um, and it does look like it could be a start of a good partnership. But there are, I'm not necessarily sold in the idea of him working with other fighters. Um, Charlie, what do you think of Floyd potentially becoming a trainer? Do you think it has to be the right fighter like a Devin Haney who can do some of the things that he used to do. Yeah. So I, I get what you mean about, um, you know, someone that great. It doesn't necessarily translate to being a good coach or a good trainer or, you know, and that, and that sort of goes for through a lot of sports as well. Um, yeah. But I mean, I used to love Floyd and watching documentaries on him and stuff. I think the thing that really, and trying to find out about Floyd Mayweather in general, what really stuck out, I can't remember who said it now, but they were they basically said, paraphrasing them, was basically like, Floyd Mayweather shows all the money, all the women, all the cars and all this, but he is the most boring man in the world. If you sit down with him, all he wants to do is talk boxing. It's all he knows. It's what he's dedicated his whole life to. Everything else is for show. Everything else is, you know, Money Mayweather and stuff like that and uh, Pretty Boy before then. And all, all of that was just, that was him selling himself and making himself this brand. But Floyd Mayweather to actually sit down and talk to, all he can talk to you about is boxing. It's all he knows. He's in the gym constantly throughout his whole career. I mean, he was, he wasn't, you know, he obviously has people throughout his career that said, oh, if he was in this generation or if he was in this generation, whatever, and, people, and if he had chose the fight at this point, the fact of the matter is that he wasn't in any other generation. He was in this generation. And Floyd Mayweather, in a lot of people's opinions, is the greatest of that generation. 
you know, he was, he's a, such a special, special fighter. And with all that knowledge that he clearly has, it, it was, it, he, he would basically, it would seem that Floyd would want you to believe that this is all just natural talent of Floyd's. Whereas in fact, it was, it was hard, hard, hard work every single day of his life. So the trainer thing, when I heard that, when I heard that story years ago, the trainer thing now doesn't surprise me that much because, <clears throat> because maybe he's maybe maybe as a trainer he's not bothered about doing the whole showman thing and he would just be a really 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 top trainer. Um, but I I would guess at he will eventually be more of an advisory manager. I know he's already got that, but I, I can't see him being a full full time trainer for the next. 10 or 15 years. I can't imagine him in, you know, the corner and having a minute or, you know, whatever to, to like, it, he doesn't strike me as that type of guy, but um, I think the knowledge he could give Haney, and as you say, Haney's style, the sort of um, earlier style of Floyd is, is not too dissimilar. I think it's a really, really interesting pair. Yeah, I completely agree. And like you said, I think that's one of the things that's really underrated with Floyd is just how hard he worked. I watched a interview uh, probably about a month ago with Zab Judah and they were really close kind of growing up and in the amateur circuit, they were kind of always sort of around the same competitions. And Zab said, you can have that natural ability, but you have to, if you don't work as hard as Floyd did, you won't be as good as him because he said you would not believe how hard Floyd worked. Um, and part of that was coming from such a rough background. He spent so much time in the gym just to get away from it. And he ended up kind of building a work rate that no one could match. Yeah. Um, Usman, what did you, what do you think of the move? Like Charlie said, I think, I think kind of advisory more position and kind of just passing on his knowledge might be kind of a more suitable role than necessarily being hands-on in the corner training. Yeah. Um, like, Charlie was saying, when I see Devin Haney, I almost see a carbon copy of Floyd um, from the way he stands to the way he fights, everything. So I do feel Floyd and Devin Haney is a partnership that could work. And like you mentioned, in terms of Floyd being a advisor, more so a trainer, I do feel like an advisory move would be the best thing because, uh, let's be honest, Floyd is not the brightest light in the room. Um, <laughs> he's, like Charlie said, all he knows is boxing, which is good in capacity when it comes to training but I feel like like we like we just discussed you need to have that bond between a trainer and a fighter almost like a father and a son and which leads me to my next point actually Floyd and Floyd Tini have never had the best relationship it's always been it's, it's always been friction between between the two because of seniors background so I feel like and also with Floyd everyone sees you know the flashy cars and money the women all this whatever they also, the fact that Floyd is, he is that person in real life. You know, if you see him, whenever there's a camera near Floyd, he is, you know, everything you see on TV. And I feel like that's not the type of personality I would want in a corner, you know? Yeah, okay, it's good to have a little bit of motivation. It's good to, you know, when you need a little kick up the backside, you know, it's good. But how, when's too much? Do you get what I'm trying to say? When is too much? Like, do you constantly want someone like Floyd? Telling you, oh, you're not doing this right. You're not doing that right. Um, your feet are all wrong. Your jab's wrong. This, that. And I've seen, I've seen, I've seen countless videos as well. There was a video of, um, I don't know if you guys have seen it. Javante Davis, he was throwing jabs at the heavy bag. And to a normal person, it would look okay. You're thinking, okay, he's got a decent jab. He's, you know, hands are up, high, everything. Then you have Floyd in the background saying, oh, no, you, you know, you're throwing it at, at the wrong angle. Oh, you're, you know, you're angling your hand. You're not stepping into it. This, that, blah, blah, blah. And I'm thinking to myself, because also what people need to understand is when it comes to fighters as well nowadays, everyone wants to be like Floyd. They all want to have you know, big mouth, the flashy cars. And I do feel like if Floyd was to go into a partnership of some sort with those type of fighters, it wouldn't really work out too well. So yeah, Jamie, I do think Floyd would be better off in an advisory role rather than being a hands-on trainer, simply due to the fact that Floyd's a type of guy you could potentially burn bridges. Yeah, I think I understand some of the points in there. I think there's, again, he, I do kind of get that. I've seen it in football, you know, it, 
sometimes if a player that was that great is clo- coaching a club, working with players that like aren't of the same standard, why you would become frustrated. And I could kind of see that happening with Floyd if he's working with fighters that just aren't getting it necessarily. Mm-hmm. They just can't do what he wants them to do. Um, so maybe kind of the more... Because although, you know, we kind of hear these stories about Floyd not being the brightest spark, business-minded, he is oh, very yeah, yeah, yeah. very astute. Um, you don't get to be as rich as he was um, and kind of taking the fights at the times that he did without being clever. Um, so I think we covered pretty much everything in that section. So we'll jump into the next topic. And the second topic is we're looking at the guys that we consider to be the most overrated and most underrated in boxing at the minute. Um, we'll start with underrated. Um, we'll kind of each each give an answer and then we'll move into the, the overrated side of it. Um, Charlie, I'll let you kick things off. Who's a guy that you consider to be underrated by most? So I have gone for Javonta Davis. Uh, I okay. Feel, I feel like he has sort of accidentally ended up in the Broner level of I really want to see this bloke get beat up um, category that some people put, you know, like like the if, if you remember when my Dana beat Broner, how sort of excited everyone was that Broner had finally lost and ha ha ha, this will shut this guy up. I mean, I don't know if people just don't know how trash talking works, but yeah. it's, you know, it's not like. Um, you know, like wrestling and stuff when the the bad guy becomes the good guy because he learned his lesson type of thing. You know, it's like, (laughs) this is, this is, they're they're salesmen at the end of the day, you know, and, and, um, and I feel like because of Javonta's um, actions outside of the ring, missing weight doesn't help him, to be honest. That is always an irritant of mine that when people miss weight, but like that, um, and, and just, just this sort of, and I think sometimes, it's just people assuming that, oh, well, he, he's seen with Adrian Broner, so he, he must be one of them sort of nuisances and stuff like that. You know, it's the, and I feel like I feel like young, cocky Americans immediately have this stigma that, oh, well, you know, then then I don't like him. And and also, I think the other thing as well that that has made him underrated is Lomachenko is obviously, you know, everyone's favourite fighter and everyone knows how great Lomachenko is and stuff like that. And he dared to call Lomachenko out. He dared to say, I'm going to beat Lomachenko. That he's, people, because Lomachenko would rightly go in favourite to that fight, but people will now want it to be, oh, it's going to be the most one-sided beatdown ever. And I genuinely don't think it would be. I think it'd be a really, really, really good fight. And I think out of all the fights, I know we spoke about all the fights down at Lightweight last week. I think that's the one that I would pay to see the most. And there is a lot of fights down there that I'd like to see. But Javonta against Loma is the fight I'd like to see. And and I think Javonta is the guy who, whilst everyone's talking about Haney and Garcia, um, Lopez, you know, you know, all these guys, obviously Lomachenko as well. I feel Javonta could still be the one who sort of the next king of that division. Maybe, maybe not, maybe not better than Lomachenko, but obviously Lomachenko is, is getting on. And as we said last week, it, it can only go on for so long, you know, and he could be the one. And and listen, if he got, if he went and beat Lomachenko in, Two years time, three years time, people would say, "Oh, he's over the hill now." Anyway, that's why he beat him, and fair enough. But one day, someone will beat Lomachenko. One of these sort of hungry, hungry boys that wanna that all want to fight him, all all willing to take it on. Mm-hmm. And I feel like Haney at the minute is the one everyone's saying. Mm-hmm. Everyone likes Garcia, you know, his golden boy links and stuff. I've just got a feeling that Javonta is the best of the lot out of those ones on the come up. And I feel like it's only his, it's only his attitude and his his sort of out of the ring stuff that has annoyed people. Um, you know, when he when he fought uh, Pedraza, I feel like that was what really sort of blew him up in everyone's. And and I thought he destroyed Pedraza that night. Um, and then obviously came over and fought Liam Walsh. 
again, you know, you don't really get these young American boys who are who are being talked up back home coming over and doing that. And he did. He really took it on. It was hostile in that that, that night. And I thought he just okay, you know, Liam Walsh is not not the uh greatest fighter ever, but I thought he absolutely destroyed him. Um yeah, yeah, so Javonta Davis is who I'm going for. Where, where do you side on that argument, Usman? Are you um, Javante Davis is overrated? Is underrated? What do you? Oh no! Um, if you know me, you know I'm a Javante Davis Oof, fanboy. At the end of the day, he's. <laughs> I tend to, you know, I, my own game. I tend to take a lot from Javante Davis himself. But I do feel like Javante Davis is. Yeah, he is underrated in the sense that. All right, people see like um, I don't know if you guys have seen. He's got this new YouTube documentary. Uh, Welcome to Baltimore. I'm not sure if you guys have come across it recently. I've not seen it, no. no so really. it's just a little new documentary. He's following him around for five nights, just that. And you see him, you know, he's wearing his chinchilla coat. He's got the Rolex watches. He's driving the Lamborghinis. But come fight night, I stand by the point when I say that there's not many better finishers in boxing than Javante Davis. It's like when he goes in for the finish, it's like watching a mini Mike Tyson. You know, the uppercuts, the straight left, everything. It's, it's awesome to watch. But like Charlie said, I do feel he needs to get his attitude on point outside of the ring because we don't want to see another brony situation and this it makes me also it makes me remember I remember a couple of years ago he was in a training camp with Adrian Broner against um, when he when Javonte Davis for um, a dude with the sideburns I've got is it Qua- Quaya Jesus Quaya yeah Jesus Quaya that training camp um, and he was with Kevin Kevin Conicum in that training camp and I feel like that was the best version of Javante Davis we've seen so far. So I feel like if he's got that type of that type of safety net behind him, you know, someone just to keep his head right. Similar similar to Shakur Stevenson, you know, he's got Andre Ward and Terence Crawford. Who else, you know, there's not many better names in boxing to have behind your back. So yeah. I do feel Javante Davis is underrated, but like Charlie said, it's just attitude that he just needs to get right, which will come with time. He's a bit in terms of boxing, the kids are babies, 24, 25 years old. Yeah, yeah. I think I think you're right though. He does need to he needs to get his head sorted before it spirals, before kind of one thing becomes another, and then he ends up getting tied into different that you know whether it's legal proceedings because you see these fires where it's like with Broner. Once one thing happens, all it, it that's pretty much it. It continues to happen and continues to happen. Um, I'm going to jump in next and give someone that I feel is underrated. Um, and I'm going to go for Murat Gassiev. Um, I recently saw a poll on Twitter asking if he was a top 10 cruiserweight of all time. And I was quite overwhelmed by the majority that said no. Um, and in a division that is historically weak, um, I just can't see I can't see how he's that underrated. Um, for me, he's easily top 10 and pushing towards, pushing towards the top five. And he might even be in the top five. I had to give it more thought. Um, but just because of his time out with injuries and promotional troubles and because of the nature of the use of performance, I think people have kind of just gone, oh, well, he was rubbish anyway. I think we spoke about it, Charlie, last week where we kind of said you have these big 50-50 fights and then the loser kind of just gets shit on and it's like, oh, well, he wasn't good anyway. That, that's what happened to Gassiev. And I think people don't realise that before that fight, a lot of people were picking Gassiev to beat him. Um and you just look at his resume, he obviously had that kind of, his breakout win was Dennis Lebedev, who's also a great cruiserweight in his own right. And although he was past his best, he put forth a brilliant performance that night. And it was like one of those, almost like Demare against Inoue. It's kind of one of those ones where he rolled back the clock and put forth a really good performance. Um, he came through that, entered the uh, World Boxing Super Series and um, slept the former WBC world champion, um, Vlod Archik, I think you say his name, um, stopped him in the third round and then got into the semis where he had an awesome fight with Dorticus, who now, once him and Yusik have moved up, it looks like Dorticus is probably one or two, depending on how the final goes with Bradis. Um, and then, obviously, what happened in the final against Yusik, I think people kind of have just forgotten that he is incredibly dangerous. I watched an interview once with Chris Ariola. It's a guy that's obviously taken punches from Vitaly Klitschko and Deontay Wilder. And he says the hardest he's been hit is by Gassiev. And that's not in a fight. That's in sparring with big padded gloves. Um, and you've seen 
Gassiev take these shots from Lebedev and from Dorcas and he doesn't even flinch. And I think he's up there with Canelo Golovkin for having one of the best chins in boxing at the minute. And I think when you see him move up to heavyweight, if he can stay fit, I think you're going to see him do some real damage. Do I think he'll do damage necessarily against the top guns? No. I think obviously Yusuf would beat him again. Um, I don't think he'd fare very well against the top guys. But again, as we're speaking out about Ruiz and those guys that are in like fourth, fifth, sixth, that kind of region, I think he gives them problems. He's big enough to set those guys, Parker and people like that, they're not massive heavyweights. And I think Gassiev is going to cause some trouble. And I think he's he's being massively underrated and people shouldn't write him off. Um, Charlie, what do, you, do you side on that same argument? Or do you think the USIP performance was an accurate reflection of actually how good he is? No, I really like Gassiev. I'm a real fan of Gassiev. Um, I, listen, Usyk is simply better than him and better than him by some distance, but that's fine. You know, you can be some distance behind Usyk and, and still be a quality fighter. As we said last week, you know, there does seem to be that. It seems like people want one extreme or the other. They're either the best or the worst and there's, there's, there's never an in-between for people, you know, and loss means the end of the world for some people. And, and and people always go on about, oh, you know, O's count for nothing. And then the moment someone loses one, it's the end of the world. Um, yeah. His fight with Dorticus was, I thought, absolutely brilliant. Maybe, maybe one of my, certainly in my top three favourites from that World world Super Series out of all the fights it's had. I love that fight. And I, but I thought... I thought he was quite clear of Dorcas that night as well. You know, I thought yeah. he had the beating of him all night long. He had the beating of him, and and there wasn't a point in the fight that I thought like Dorcas didn't didn't fight badly, but I just felt Gassiev the whole way through was the better man. So to think that now, and as you say, Dorcas is now in the final again, and I think that's sort of why he's moved up because losing to Usyk, he okay, he could have re-entered the tournament and won it, but. But what's the point? You know, he he he's he. I think he is better than the two in the final, and I rate the two in the final as well. But I'd have Gassiev ahead of both of them. Him v Breedis would 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 be good. But um, it, I'm I'm interested to see what he does up at heavyweight. And I feel like I feel like because of all the he keep, his injuries that have sort of stagnated his um his heavyweight career and stuff. I feel like if because isn't he with Matchroom now? No. So he he actually signed with Matchroom, and then after a couple of his de- dates got delayed, he somehow cancelled it, and then kind of signed with another promotional company. It's really up in the air. Right, right. That's a shame actually, because he's definitely the type of name that, um, like, I'd much rather see Gassiev Chisora than Yusik Chisora. Yeah, exactly. You know, I would I would much rather see where Gassiev is in the heavyweight position than Yusuf because I don't think we learn anything from Yusuf beating up Jazora. I just don't think we learn anything from it, you know. Um but Gassiev against Chisora. If Gassiev rocked up and beat Chisora, not that Ch- Chisora is is like sort of sort of a gatekeeper, but not really, you know, but I just feel like if he if he could go up there and take someone like Chisora out it then, it, it, you know, suddenly uh, Gassiev v. White, for example, is then a really big fight. You know, a really, really big fight. And as we've alluded to a couple of times tonight, there's outside of Fury, Joshua, Wilder, and probably Usyk, there's, there's some really good fights to be had in the heavyweight division. And just because they may not be for the world title at the minute, it doesn't mean that there's not some, not some cracking fights to be made. And I, I, I see no reason why Gassiev um, shouldn't be in that. Yeah, I really, I actually, re- you mentioned it um, quickly. Then I actually really like the Bradis fight. I, I, I do do like that fight, um, and that's kind of one that I feel like got away a bit at cruiserweight. Like it, it's annoying that it didn't happen. Yeah. Um, but yeah, this promotional thing as well is just one thing that he needs to get kind of under wraps and get it sorted because Matram have the lion's share of the heavyweights, um, especially those guys that we're talking about that are kind of in the middle of the rankings. Like Matram have kind of the fair share of them and he could have been involved in some good fights. Um, 
So, Usman, we're going to go over to you now for an underrated pick. Who are you picking as your as your candidate? Um, also, a historical pick, um, Floyd Patterson. Simply because, okay, you're going yeah, back. So for yeah, my I'm pick for underrated team. Floyd Patterson, simply because to be, you know, a middleweight and win a gold medal in 1960 and then to go on and, sorry, 1950, and then go on as a middleweight to win the heavyweight title, not once, but twice at such a young age as well. Um, he beat Archie Moore for the title, defended it a few times, and he fought Brian London in the process. Again, lost the title to Ingemar Johnson, but, you know, he had the makings of a champion by winning the belt back and going on to defend it twice more. And I just feel like Floyd was unlucky in the sense he came across Sonny Liston, not once, but twice, and also Muhammad Ali as well. So, and also I feel Floyd Patterson's on the raid in the sense that Customari was actually um, a teacher of Floyd Patterson as well. So when I see Floyd Patterson, I see a lot of similarities with Mike Tyson in the sense, you know, they had the same peak of use style, the gazelle punch, um, the bobbing and weaving. The difference between the two was Floyd's, Floyd's style of peak of was more, more artistic. You know, it was more, it, it wasn't aggressive like Mike Tyson's. It was more artistic, a little bit more, there was more flash behind it. So I feel like, and I say this to a lot of people, Floyd Patterson was a mini Mike Tyson before Mike Tyson. So I think I'll always stand by the pick that Patterson is my all-time underrated fighter. You know, I just feel like he got unlucky in the sense that there was no in-between divisions. Like there was no light heavyweight, cruiserweight, super middleweight in those days. And yeah, he was a small heavyweight. So for him to take a beating off the bigger guys was one thing. But, you know, to say I was a world champion at 22 years old and defend the belt. Yeah, so Floyd Patterson for me. Yeah, that's that's a good pick if we're going historical. Like you said, he gets shit on a little bit because people just see the Sonny Liston defeats. Of course, yeah, and yeah. kind of uh, Ingemar isn't kind of remembered as a great champion either, so they don't stand out as good wins. Um, but for the people that actually know their boxing, we'll, we'll rate for a person and rate those victories. Um, now that we've given all an underrated pick, we'll move on to overrated. Um, and we'll go back round to Charlie. Um I'm kind of delaying my pick because I think I'm going to be a little bit controversial. So, Charlie, I'll let you jump in with your pick. Who do you consider to be a little bit overrated? So I'm glad you've said you're going to be controversial because I think I'm going to be as well. So <laughs> at least maybe you might take the heat off me. Um, yeah. I have gone for Gennady Golovkin. Uh, reason is because when I hear the word overrated, I don't, I don't necessarily think of it as uh, people think he's good, but he's actually shit. I rate Golovkin really highly. I think he's a really good fighter. But the levels that I've heard him be put on for the like the last six or seven years now, it seems, I've never really seen him live up to that high of a level like that he gets talked about. Um, I feel like he spent a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot of his career with Martin Murray as the best name on his on his resume, to be honest. Um, yeah. I know his win against David Lemieux was very impressive, but, you know, Saunders also was very impressive against um, Lemieux. And I, I don't, like, I feel like Gennady Golovkin's fans would talk about Saunders Golovkin as a one-sided beatdown, you know, yeah. um, for Golovkin. Um, and then his sort of four biggest fights, I, I, he just, he just, he's the first fight against Canelo. Okay. And this is where I think I might get a lot of stick. I don't think that Golovkin won that fight as clearly as it is now accepted in the boxing world, that that was daylight robbery. It's disgusting. He wasn't given the win. It's, I've, I've watched it. I've watched it four times I think because of because of the reviews I see on it and I can see why it gets given to Golovkin by most but I do think that the argument is clouded by Adelaide Bird's um, scoring on it and I feel yeah, like had that scoring had been given uh, 115, 113 for example I think people would have still said oh, I can't believe that he's got a draw there. I think people would have still believed Golovkin won, but it then came with all the memes and all the videos and all this of 
of, of uh, Oscar Del Hoya paying her and stuff like that. And the argument I've always had is, if you paid a judge, would you not just pay to get the win? You wouldn't. There's, he got nothing out of her scoring it really widely, except for people being making sort of conspiracy theories. Do you see what I mean? There's the, the, it doesn't matter if you win the fight 120, 108, or 115, 113. If you win the fight, you win the fight, and that's it. And that's why the scoring has always bothered me, that people go on about it so much. The, the way that she scored that fight didn't change her perception that Canelo won, and that was all that was important. She believed Canelo won the fight. And... And then in the second fight, I gave it to Canelo. The first time I watched Canelo Golovkin, the first one, I gave it a draw. I, I can now see why Golovkin is is like so, is sort of accepted that he won that first fight. The second fight I gave to Canelo. Um, the uh, Derevchenko fight, again, I had Golovkin losing. Um, and the Jacobs fight, I felt like the knockdown won it for Golovkin. And the, the, you know, so that would be two wins out of four. I'm sort of willing to give him, you know, willing in the in the least sort of pedantic way possible. Mm. You know, I just I just feel like when he's been at the very very top, his top four fight, he's never overly impressed me. Like to to the point oh. where I thought he really is the best sort of middleweight on the planet. There's there's no one close to him. And now obviously age is a factor, and and like the Derevchenko fight is all put down to his age. Oh, well, he's past it now then. It doesn't, and, and I just feel like it's always a quick sort of excuse when someone people like just notoriously like, like Golovkin has just always been a fan favourite, it seems. And Canelo isn't a fan favourite. So their fight sort of got billed as sort of good v bad. You know, one of them is the good guy, one of them is the bad guy for whatever reason. And... Yeah, I just I just feel like at the very very top of his game before he ever got to the to the big fights, he just got talked about as oh he'll walk through anyone, he'll smash them all. You know, um, I remember um, um, when just before he had had them fights, there was always just this feeling that no one could touch him, and then when he got to those fights and he didn't just walk through, like Jacobs for example, he didn't just walk through Danny Jacobs. Was when I was started to think to myself, maybe maybe he isn't just this unstoppable machine. And the Canelo fights, I really like Canelo. I've always rated Canelo. Um, the Canelo fight sort of really drummed that home and then the Derevchenko fight again. And now I feel it's just a, it's a, when he, if he does lose his next fight or his next sort of big fight, it will just be completely accepted that, oh, well, he's old now and it doesn't count anyway. Um, so yeah. Golovkin. Jamie, I hope you come up with something more controversial because I think I'm in trouble. No, don't worry. Mine will be more controversial. I actually, so with your pick, part of me agrees. Um, So the way I look at it is I think once upon a time, Gennady Golovkin was an all-time great talent. I think those fights where he beat the likes of Gil and Murray and all these guys, he was an elite talent, but he couldn't show it because the opponents he was facing just weren't of that of that ilk. Um, and I think by the time he got to the better fights, he may have just slightly passed his peak. But I think when you look at Golovkin, I think you're looking at a, a great talent, but just with a bang average resume. And I think the thing that gets him overrated is when people just look at his talent and don't consider the resume enough. Um, and like you... Those Canelo fights, I don't see them as outright outrageous as other people do. I think the first one, you can make, you can, I can see why you think Golovkin won that well enough to think, how did Canelo win? But the, the, it wasn't as outrageous as people made it out to be. And like you said, the scorecard kind of skewed that mostly. Um, but the second fight, I had Canelo winning. The first fight, I think that the first time I watched it, I gave it to Golovkin by one and have watched it since and scored it a draw. Um, so I do think, like you, he is a little bit overrated, largely because his talent doesn't stack up with his resume. How good he actually was at one point, he didn't prove it um, in those later fights when he fought, you know, these... Jacobs and guys like that, he should have been beating them more clearly if you're a great fighter. 
Um, and I think Canelo, he, if he was as great as some people make him out to be, he would have dealt with those fights better. Um, Usman, we're going to move on to you. Yeah. Um, before I kind of um, stop everyone listening to the podcast for the person <laughs> I go with. Um, who, who are you picking for your overrated pick? Yeah, so for my overrated fight, I am going to take it back again. Um, Sonny Liston for me. Um, okay. I, f- I feel like Sonny Liston was overrated in the sense that before the whole heavyweight champion of the world thing, you look through his resume and you think, Sonny Liston didn't fight anyone of note. He actually lost to um, uh, Marty Marshall in his eighth fight. Okay, split decision, but still, someone like Sonny Liston should not be losing to someone like a journeyman early in their career. So time goes on and he fights. Okay, Cle- Cleveland Williams happened to be a good win on his record. But other than that, you know, he beat up Floyd Patterson for the title and he only defended it once. And like we mentioned before, Floyd Patterson was a small heavyweight. So for Patterson, uh, sorry, for Liston to beat Patterson twice, it was no surprise. And I feel like, yeah, so his, when you look through his record, it's like, you see, he only had one title defense on his record and that was a rematch against Patterson. He, and obviously everyone knows what happened in the next two fights, Muhammad Ali. Um, and whether, you know, the first Ali fight was not close at all. Okay, the first couple of rounds, they were feeling each other out. But once Ali got, in his, got into his rhythm, it was beautiful to watch. Liston was getting, you know, Liston was getting lit up left, right, center in that fight. So much so, he actually tried to blind Ali, I believe. Um, yeah. And then obviously in the second fight, the phantom punch, whatever people think of the phantom punch and all the conspiracies behind it. Um, I'm not going to delve too much into that, but I do feel like, you know, Liston could have... Because the way people talk about him, they talk about, you know, he's to come to the ring wearing his hooded towels and the fact he got arrested 10 times. All right, stature and personality aside, we're not talking about Sonny Liston as a person. We're talking about him as a fighter. Like everything I've said, I do not think Sonny Liston is a top 10 heavyweight of all time, like some people say, simply because of the fact that he beat a smaller guy to win the world title and then he only defended once. And the best guy he fought, Ali, obviously, like I said, the performances speak for themselves. And I think after the Ali fight, he didn't really, you know, he's kind of just vanished into the darkness, so to see. Because I know he fought a run of journeyman after that and he ended his, he ended his career by fighting Chuck Webner. There was no one else of note. And obviously his death and the circumstances that surround it a few years later. But that aside, um, pure resume, I do feel like Sonny Liston was quite overrated as not just a fighter, but as also a heavyweight champion. That's an interesting one. I hadn't, I've never given that topic enough thought to mm. kind of make an, my own judgment. Um, but I can see what you're saying. I think part of that, and going back to Floyd Patterson being underrated, there was a period after Joe Lewis um, and after Ezra Charles and Joe Walcott where Marciano was champion and the division was a little bit dead. That's one of the criticisms of Marciano is that his competition was weak. And I think it then moved on to Patterson and um, Ingemar and it was a really weak kind of stage. And I think Liston inherited that, but he beat the only other guy around at that time of note in Patterson. But then, like you said, the the, the Ali fights kind of really skew his legacy. Mm. Um, now, I'm about to set the world on fire and give my pick. Um, and for my overrated fighter, uh, I'm going for Inoue. Now, mm. I'm, I'm making a quick disclaimer <laughs> um, before everyone hates me. Um, I have Inoue fourth in the pound for pound list. Um, I consider him to be, you know, an elite level talent. He's one of the most explosive fighters of the past decade, probably late in, like going back to the 90s and early 2000s. Um, and for me, he's one of the best body punchers and his jab is excellent. There's things I really like about his game and think he's worthy of that pound for pound status. Um, my reason for stating he's overstated is mainly for the people that overrate him when considering these pound for pound arguments. You know, off the back of an Inoue performance, because he is so explosive and he does blast people away, people suddenly go, right, that's it. He's pound for pound number one. He's in the argument. He's just blown away such and such. He's he's that good. But for me, in terms of just pure ability, if you take away his power, obviously his power is probably his most valuable asset, but if you take that away from him, he is not as skilled or as talented as the 
other guys in the top five, so Usyk, Canelo, Loma or Crawford, and I don't think he's even a talent a talent as who I have in sixth in Estrada. Um, I don't think he's quite on their skill level. Um, and I do think, like Donaire showed, if you can live with the power, you can make him look a little bit ordinary. Um, he's still good enough to beat you, still good enough to help box you, and he's only young, so he is going to approve, um, improve. But people seem to have this thing after he beats someone, it's like, he's pound for pound number one. He's going to go up to f- all the way up to featherweight and he's going to beat everyone. How does a fantasy match with Loma at featherweight go and things like this? And th- that's the reason I think people are overrating him because for me, super bantamweight, which is obviously the weight above what he's operating at now, I think that's his ceiling. Um, I think once you move up to featherweight, you're getting in with guys that are just too physically big and durable and your power doesn't carry the same kind of feeling. Um, and even at 122, I think you'll start seeing the signs of him not having the same kind of physical explosion and assets that he has at bantamweight. I think he beat, you know, people talk about the Navarrete fight being a good fight. I get that, but I also think he beats Navarrete pretty comfortably because I think he's a little bit podgy and he's not quite... I think he can outwork him to the body and take him out. Um, I think he beats Ray Vargas. I think that Madalia fight's a really good fight because it's a big, durable, super bantamweight. weight. Um, so the reason I'm saying he's overrated is because of the way people talk about him, not necessarily on his ability or his resume. I'm talking about the way people kind of think that he's pound for pound number one and people want to say he'll go up to featherweight and he'd win in a fight against Loma at featherweight and things like that. That's why I'm overrating him. Um, Charlie, am I completely bonkers or do you, can you see kind of where I'm coming from with that? So I'm a big fan of him, as you know. Um, and I didn't think his name would be thrown in the overrated category. Um, I get, I get what you're saying that that you know your disclaimer beforehand, which some may call it chickening out. I don't know. I wouldn't say that, but some listeners may say that you've chickened out. As um, it suggests that you obviously do see his worth, do see how good he is. It's it's the overrating from fourth best to first best basically yeah and, exactly and that, and that overrating does that that still counts you know it doesn't matter if you overrate someone a hundred places up on on a you know uh, a, a mythical list or if you put them up just a few places especially at the very top like that fourth to first is a can be a big gap um he certainly still has to do more there's there's more there's a lot more that i'd like to see him do but the one thing i will say about him is like, like his fight against Manny Rodriguez, for example, I thought to myself, this could be interesting. You know, he could be, you know, Manny look, has looked a good fighter and and he just, the way he blasts him out again, you know, and, and it did get to that point where it's just like, well, he's going to get in that final with Denaire and Denaire's a bit old now, so he's going to blast him out. And obviously where he didn't, but because he put on such a good fight, the pair of them did, it was such a good fight. It was almost like, and and he still won convincingly. You know, it, it, I, I came away from it feeling like he's, he's showed us something else about his game and it's not just about blasting them out. Um, I was, I was, I was as, as I said last week, I was looking forward to his fight with Casemiro. I thought that had, that had the makings of a really good fight where I thought he'd win, but I thought he had the makings of a really good fight. Um, to sort of throw the question back to you, what if you could sort of make a dream matchup of his for the next three fights to to prove to you that he was say not fourth, say to move him up to second in your list, what would he have to do? For me, he'd have to. It's hard to say. I'm just trying to think of who is around. So a bantamweight. I see. The thing is, I think he's by far and away the best bantamweight in the world. The and like you said with the disclaimer, I kind of use that to to suggest that I don't underrate him. Yeah. I I actually rate him for what I believe he is. I just don't rate him as much as the people that think that he's going to blitz through divisions and do a Pacquiao and climb up the weights and knock everyone out. Um, Fights for me, I would like to see him clean up. So the Casemiro fight, 
there was a, the fight I did really like was the Lewis Neri fight. Um, but Neri again is one of these guys that just can't seem to get his head screwed on. Um, but uh, Super Bantam, I really like the Ahmad Leo fight. I think he's he's young, he's fresh, he's durable, um, and he's talented. You know, he's a good amateur. He's got that kind of Uzbekistan style that's becoming popular now and is becoming successful. That's one fight I would really like. Um, do you know another fight I would like? I would like to see, and it pains me because I think he wins at this stage, but even um, Rigondo, yeah. I would like to see, for, see that from a point of maybe if he's getting a little bit frustrated. Yeah. Like, I know Rigondo's timing and his speed isn't what it was, but say, you know, say for four or five rounds early in that fight, he doesn't, doesn't catch him and Rigondo's kind of in his flow. He's kind of in his element. How does he react to that? And does he start becoming a little bit gung ho and just kind of start trying to knock him out? Or does he does he take his time? Does he pick a shot where we all go, wow, that was impressive that he was patient enough to pick that? Um so they're two kind of fights that I'd like to see. But they're the fights I'd like to see are in around super bantamweight, because I, I personally think he'll he'll clean up at Bantamweight now. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Usman, do you do you think I'm kind of over, I'm kind of underrating the new age. Do you think I'm along the right lines, or what do you? What's your assessment of it? Again, like you said, I think with the new age, okay, cool. He's you know he's destroyed everyone. You know Rodriguez. Um, yeah, yeah, he has got a few signature knockout performances on his record. Um, even guys like Nieves and you know Payano, but I do feel like in new age to uh, make his mark on the game and to put a stamp on where he is right now, I do feel like he needs to move up. And again, that will come with time as well. But I do also feel like what you said, if you take away his power, what else is there to his game? Because I've noticed the new way, he, again, he's like one of those typical power punches, loves to load up on on every punch. And I feel like when he comes up against an elite fighter um, at Bantamweight, at Super Bantamweight, wherever it may be, if he gets frustrated, will he be able to bank on that power at the higher weights? That's the only thing I feel like which may could potentially be his downfall. Other than that, I don't think there's too much I can say about whether he's you know, overrated, underrated, because from what I've seen of him, I have been quite convinced. And like Charlie mentioned as well, the uh, Manny Rodriguez fight, because I think Manny Rodriguez came over to the UK and he'd be... Um, was it shoot, was it Butler or who? I can't remember who he beat to win his world but, title. Butler, that was. It was Butler, was it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I was quite impressed with Rodriguez that night. And coming into the fight between Rodriguez and Inoue on the Josh Taylor on the card, I thought this is going to be a good fight. I don't know why it's a co-main event fight because you know the Japanese are out there enforcing everything. And to, 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 so what he did, to, um, what he did to Rodriguez was quite, you know, it was. It was almost terrifying and also the uh, McDonald fight Jamie McDonald um, to do what he did to McDonald was, was unreal so but like I said I do feel like Inoue needs to kind of get that signature win underneath his belt to really be considered amongst the elite yeah I think he needs that that win that I feel like all these guys when they go down in history or whether they're in the, the pound for pound this state they have that win the guys that are really pushing towards the top have that win. For Usyk, it's Gassiev. Mm. Um, you know, he has that win that just puts him up there. You know, Canelo's reeling them off at the minute with the Kovalevs and the Jacobs and the Golovkins. Um, even when you look at Estrada, you look at the um, he's beat Rung oh, yeah. Um He's got these wins. Um, and that's why, actually, I have Inoue above Crawford. Although I think Crawford is more talented, Inoue... And they're both free weight world champions. I give Inoue the credit of he's got better wins than Crawford. I have Denaire as a better win. I also think Manny Rodriguez at the time I thought he was going to give him a good fight, yeah. and he just blitzed him. And it was like you said, it was scary. Like that moment where Rodriguez was like on his knee and he was blinking, and he kind oh, of yeah, took yeah. a breath and got and he got back up because he had to, but he really didn't want to. Um, so I do think he's frightening, and he's only twenty seven. So think in three years. I mean, he's only going to be better, isn't he? So I do think he is going to go on to push for those spots. And I hope he does. I hope he proves me wrong. Um, 
Is there anyone, I'll put it back to you, Charlie, quickly before we move on to the next topic. Was there anyone that maybe you thought might come up? It's funny, I thought I thought Javante Davis might actually come up in the overrated thing because of his recent performances. Not necessarily because I think he's overrated, but just for his recent performances. Is there anyone that you thought might come up? Um, it's a hard one because it's... Oh, overrated is such a strange term, isn't it? Because... The, the words overrated should just be that, that they're, they're rated higher than you rate them. But, but it, it's a term that's almost used to say, I don't like him. I think he's shit. So it, that, that's what sort of eventually led me to Golovkin, that I, I wanted to get sort of how you did in a way with a new eight. I, I, I wanted to choose someone that I absolutely do rate. I just don't rate him as highly as I, as I hear some people sort of, Saying and and when you said to me, um, uh, when you were saying just then before I did uh, before you did yours that you're you've got one that people are going to kick off about, and I thought you was going to say um, Errol Spence. I don't okay. know, right? I just I just felt like that's what was going to come out of your mouth. I have no idea why I thought that, but it did cross my mind. Yeah, I, I I don't know. I don't know what it was. I was just convinced. I bet he says Errol Spence. Um, so I don't know if I thought that that was going to crop up earlier on today, but. Yeah, when you said that, I, that's what I thought was going to come up. And do you know what's funny? The reason he was one of my picks was actually for the same logic behind Inoue. I think he's brilliant and I think he deserves to be in the pound for pound list. It's just some people's, most people's lists seem to have him in the fourth and fifths uh, ahead of people like Usyk and Estrada. For me, he's not that good, but I don't underrate him in the sense that I don't think he should be in the argument entirely. Um, but yeah, it's a subjective, isn't it? Because, you know, people, fighters, their fans think they're underrated, but the people that hate them think they're overrated. So obviously it's subjective to the person. Um, we're going to move into our third topic now, our final topic, and we're going to do our favourite fight of all time. Um, so everyone's got their favourite fight for different reasons. And we didn't just restrict this to, um, you know, what's your favourite necessarily to watch because it was dramatic or it was barbaric. What Maybe it just it's just your favourite fight because the fighter you supported won. Um, it's a fighter that maybe, you know, you've got a connection with, so you just you were happy he won that night and it stands out as a memory. Um, so we're going to go to you first, Charlie. What's, a, what's your favourite fight of all time? So my favourite fight of all time was over inside four rounds. Um, yeah, it was the fight that made me fall in love with boxing. So when you asked me this question, when you put this question towards towards me, I went through loads and loads of obvious fights. First of all, came into my head, um, and then then some obscure ones came into my head, and then I decided that I wanted it to be personal to me, and that was the fight that made me a boxing fan, like sort of first and foremost. And I'm not, not to say that I watched this fight and then I watched every boxing match ever since that day because I was only seven. So that obviously wasn't the case, but it was the, it was the fight that made me, um, made me interested in the sport, made me, and, and the fight I always immediately think back to when, oh, what, what got you into boxing? It's always this, it always has been this. I was obsessed with Prince Nazim. Um, as a kid, I loved everything about him. His show, the, the way he was a showman, the way he talked, the way how cocky he was, how sure of himself he was. My mum hated him, and I loved him. She could not <laughs> understand why this man was my hero, and he, I just adored him. And his fight with Kevin Kelly was just—it was. I remember it was on Sky Box Office. We didn't have Sky at the time, and our neighbour did. And they ordered the fight and I went round the next morning to watch the rerun. And I was just so excited to see this man. I had no idea at the time who Kevin Kelly was or anything like that. It's what makes the fight so good being able to watch it back now. Um, and I do watch it back now. Um, it comes on, you know, every sort of, well, depending on if I'm drinking, it gets stuck on, you know, on a YouTube <laughs> at like two in the morning. Um, and, uh, yeah, the four rounds were just explosive. Just two guys who weren't that big that were hitting each other that hard. I mean, I don't know if either of you have seen it, and, and I'm sure you haven't, or when the last time yeah. was that you saw it. It's that each 
knockdown looks like it's taken the other guy out. I think it, <laughs> I think it was four to Nazim, three to Kelly, and, and Nazim also had one that didn't count, if I remember rightly. And it was just, I mean, it, the first round starts with Nazim just, just jabbing Kelly's head off. And out of nowhere, Kelly comes in with this big looping right that just, it looks like it takes him out. Just can put his eyes roll to the back of his head and he's up. And he he is, by the end of that round, chasing Kelly around the ring. Um, it was just it was just such a such a good fight. It was over too quickly, unfortunately. But they were laying such heavy heavy blows on each other that it simply couldn't go the twelve rounds. And if Nazim hadn't have got rid of Kelly, Kelly would have got rid of Nazim. You know, they they, they just wouldn't have lasted twelve rounds. Um, Kevin Kelly obviously uh, uh, said before the fight, "I'm going to smoke your boots." to him and uh prince nazim i don't know if you've watched his sporting heroes on um sky but he um he says to the to the guy interviewing him he told me he's going to smoke my boots and he said i had no idea what that meant like i didn't i'd never heard that term before smoke your boots and he said, <laughs> when, he, when he hit me my feet felt like they were on fire he said i don't know what it was but it ran all the way down my face through my body down my legs and into my feet and my feet were burning and he was like, and that's what he must have meant by he was going to smoke my feet. Like, <laughs> so hard that my feet were hurting. So, um, so yeah, that that is is the fight that got me into boxing. That was, I was seven, I, but but it was. I remember it was near Christmas time. I was probably about seven and a half at the time. And um, as I say, I didn't then watch every fight ever from then on. But it was certainly the fight that I always thought this will be a sport I just always always watch. Good stuff. It's it's always nice to hear people's kind of stories of what got them into it. Yeah, yeah. I um, listen. I'm just going to quickly come to you. So, okay, cool. Hamed, for me, I um, I remember my earliest memories of Hamed. So obviously, I kind of I wasn't old enough during his peak or during those years, or I might not even been born thinking about it. Um, but kind of growing up, I remember the first time I watched footage of Nassim, and I remember thinking, oh my god, like how cocky and how how cool it was to see him jumping over ropes and doing the things he was doing and um I remember I said to my dad because obviously my dad's the person that got me into boxing I remember saying Nassim Hamid da, da, da. and I remember him going yeah but he, he got found out when he fought Barrera yeah, that, yeah, that's yeah. all that ma- that's all that got that's all that matters what are your kind of perceptions of Hamid and how do you reflect on on his career when you look back because you're the same age as me so how do yeah, you yeah, hold yeah. Hamid Again, when it comes to Hamid, like you, I don't really have much memories of Hamid, other than, you know, to a lot of British fight fans, he was the hero, you know. Um, but I also feel like he was like Marmite, or Marmalade, whatever the saying is, you either love him or you don't. Um, but from what I've seen of him, I, you know, that's, 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 who, that's the type of fighter I, I love, love to watch, you know, the flashy stuff. Um, his agility as well, it was so weird, the way he used to dodge punches, it was like, something out of a Star Wars film, something. But, um, but when you look through his career, I do feel like he fought a decent level of opposition. You know, Wilfredo, uh, Wilfredo Gomez, like Charlie said, Kevin Kelly. Um, I remember a friend of mine, a close friend of mine, also mentions to me a lot uh, the Augie Sanchez fight because Sanchez was one of the few to beat Mayweather as an amateur and actually one of the last few to beat Mayweather as an amateur. And I've seen the knockout on YouTube and it was, you know, again, people talk about Javante Davis at featherweight. But this man was knocking out guys cold, stiff as well for a featherweight. So, and the yeah. fact he, he reigned as well for quite a long time. Um, you know, I think he, I did, I did think he achieved quite a lot, but I do feel like he could have achieved more because he retired. Um, obviously, I don't remember when he retired because I was, I was a kid, but wasn't he like 29 or 30 when he retired? Yeah, he was, he was young. He had a, he had a real, I mean, you know, the size of him now. He again on that, <laughs> on that sporting hero. He said like he just he just loved food so much. He was like when he wasn't when he wasn't training, he was just eating constantly. <laughs> and his training was like the bane of his life. And when he lost that Barrera fight, it was that was sort of the night. If I again, I mean, I, I wasn't you know twenty years old when this was going on. I was seven, eight, nine, ten years old, but. What I can remember of it, that was the night, you know, the night that he was really meant to crown himself. And because he didn't, 
he, he just dis, he disappeared for uh, I, I'd have to check the dates but it felt like he disappeared for ages like out of the limelight and everything and I think he had one more fight after that and no one really believed he was ever going to come back for that one more fight and he did and then he retired and I still believe it's people like Nazim Hamid that is the reason people like Joshua when he lost his fight was being asked are you going to retire because I feel like that type of stuff used to happen more than it does. Whereas now it gets laughed off. Like, why on earth would he retire? You know, there's still money to be made. There's still big fights. There's world titles to win back and blah, 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 blah. Why on earth would he retire? Whereas Nazim Hamid could have easily fought that as well. What, okay, I've lost to Barrera. So what? I'll, I'll keep going. And, but he just he just didn't. He was just done with it then. And, and as I say, I remember he came back for one more fight, I believe. And then, and he won that, and then he was, then he was gone. And it's a shame. It's a shame, but obviously, some people don't have that outright dedication. But he used to throw throw shots from the most awkward of angles. He would sort of <laughs> jump, in, jump into yeah, his yeah, punches yeah. were really weird. Um, but yeah, just I mean, as you as you alluded to, just knocking people out cold. His knockout of Kelly as well. He just absolutely plants him. Mm. Um, yeah, that just could could really really fight bang and he just and he had everything as well he was he was really confident cocky and he was backing it up as well and I know what Jamie's saying about what his dad says because there was a guy at my my old workplace who used to say the exact same thing yeah but he got shut up when he got in the big fight true but he also had some very good fights before then where he was excellent and backing his talk up yeah I think um yeah, you're right, Charlie. He returned 11 months later um, and he won on points, um, which is obviously out of character for him because he loved to finish people in the distance. Um, he, again, he he's one of the, he, a bit similar to what we said about Andy Ruiz earlier. He got a taste for the limelight and he ditched the Brendan Ingle set up that really made him who he was um, and went stateside with Manny Stewart and that and it just didn't didn't have the same effect and when he lost to Barrera because even though he'd left Brendan Ingle he still felt invincible so to then lose and lose that invincibility it's like you said it really kind of affects affects your mindset and back in those days you you didn't have social media so if you did disappear it wasn't quite as you weren't as hounded as badly if it was to happen now yeah um so, Usman, we're going to move on to you. Yeah. What's your favourite fight of all time? Um, I'm intrigued to know this because I don't think I've <laughs> ever asked you. Again, my favourite fight. Again, there's a little story behind it. And Charlie said his favourite fight was over in four rounds. Mine was over in one. Um, so, this fight, I remember back in the days, um, little backstory. I was seven years old and Roy Jones had just beat John Ruiz for the heavyweight title. And like Charlie, his hero was, now he's growing up, mine was Roy Jones. Um, Awesome to watch. Like, Roy Jones was my guy. Everyone knows how much I love him. And I remember back in the days, my old man used to stay up and watch fights as well. Sorry, not stay up and watch. Well, he was a fight fan. And there's one particular fight. He, re- he used to record them on his old um, uh, VHS. And I remember as a kid, I used to look through the cupboard and he had all these like little old boxing fights, you know, Nigel Byrne, Gerald McClellan, um, Hagler, Hearns. He had all them on tape. And there's one particular one I pulled out before I pulled this one out, my old man told me the story of, of Roy Jones' career. And he told me his career up until the point of the Montel Griffin fight, the first fight. And I knew by then Roy Jones had taken the L. I knew he'd lost. Um, and even though I didn't see the fight, from what I had seen of Roy at that stage, I thought, oh my God, Roy Jones lost. How? Okay, disqualification, but still a loss. And I remember pulling out this um, videotape. And it said on it, Roy Jones versus Montel Griffin too. And for me, that is my all-time favourite fight, simply because of the way he bounced back from the first fight. So as a kid, I put the VHS, I put the videotape into the video player. And I didn't know, I was blind to what was going on in the fight. You know, I haven't, I hadn't heard of this fight as a kid. So I'm watching the fight and all of a sudden he walks to the centre of the ring and he throws a big left hook, which sends Griffin stumbling back onto the ropes. And the referee ruled it a knockdown. And I'm thinking, okay, Knockdown. Let's see, did he finish the fight? Did he, you know, as a kid, you're wondering, was it finished? All of a sudden, he's trying to look. And I remember, I think it was Emmanuel Stewart on HBO on the commentary. He actually said himself, Roy is looking for a first round knockout. And 
there was times in that fight, in that first round, where he got reckless. And while he was looking for the knockout, I'm thinking to myself, he's going to get clipped, he's going to get clipped. And all of a sudden, from nowhere, it's like this punch came from, from, like, from his waist. It was almost like a corkscrew, not a left hook, not an uppercut. I don't know what, t- what the punch was, but it knocked Griffin cold. Like, splits the guard right from his hip, you know, left hand, I don't know. I still can't explain what type of punch it was. Um, people can see on YouTube for themselves if they search it. But yeah, so this left hook connects and Griffin's you know, stumbling on the floor and, you know, Roy's up there in the corner. And I remember the commentary line as well, where he, and it still stands out to me to this day, where um, Jim Lampley actually said, you know, he's got his vindication, first round knockout. And from then, that was kind of... I put it up there as my favourite fight because that's the fight that made me fall in love with Roy Jones. And I still stand by the point. In his prime, he was the most naturally gifted fighter there was. When it comes to pure ability, speed, power, reflexes, the prime Roy Jones was, you know, he was unstoppable. So yeah, the Griffin rematch for me is my all-time favourite fight simply because of the story behind it, how it led me to being a massive fan of Roy Jones. Yeah, I am... Um gonna throw a little promotion out there if you guys listen to us get a minute go to the neutral corner boxing.com and read usman's article about roy jones it's really personal and it's a really good insight into why roy jones was usman's favorite fighter and you kind of you paint his picture in a, his career in a really different light um roy jones just for the rec- so, just for the record is when i read it the other day really really good read mate yeah appreciate it buddy so i've it's funny. My earliest memory, or I think it's my earliest memory of Roy Jones. I remember staying up to watch him against Joe Calzaghe. And I just remember mm. my dad talking about how good Roy Jones was. And from that point, yeah, I beca- yeah. kind, of came, kind of became obsessed with him. Um, and looking back at, at looking back at him during the 90s, someone put a thing on Twitter the other day. I can't remember who it was um, and talked about kind of, boxers in their peak what was the most unbeatable peak and it kind of listed Duran um in the late 70s when he was at lightweight it kind of mentioned Floyd when he was at super feather I looked at Pennell in the at late 80s early 90s um but the one that really stood out for me was Roy in the 90s I do think that is probably the most unbeatable version of a mm-hmm. fighter we've ever seen 100%. Charlie yeah Charlie do you think that's that's worthy to say I just looking when you watch him they're kind of he he didn't just rely on skill he at that point in time he had so much natural athleticism that he could he could generate that power and speed just through how physically like blessed he was that it just kind of that peak I don't think could be rivaled he was unbelievable he was absolutely unbelievable and it's such a shame the sort of losses that have added to his resume since because I don't think he'll ever like obviously with, with with boxing fans they don't they're not going to look at that but just when you're trying to explain someone although the biggest sort of um compliment i can give roy jones junior is he is the guy that even friends of mine that i that i know aren't that into boxing if you ask them about a fighter that maybe not around anymore or just just think i'll just think back to like the 90s or an early 2000s think of a fight his name crops up so much like his he and 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 not just because oh i know that name roy jones jr because it's you know it's, it's a name as well that sort of rolls off the tongue they can sort of explain to you of, but because there was that youtube clip i'm sure everyone's seen it the the no punch knockdown you know when he yeah, sort yeah, of yeah, dodges, yeah. yeah that and and stuff like that but they can even people who aren't into boxing know what Roy Jones Jr., sort of how he fought. Not just, oh, I know that name. What was he? A really good, did he knock everyone out? They're not, not even that. It's like they're, they're like, he was really skillful, weren't he? And, and I think that is, for, for, for that to come from people who don't even really watch boxing means you, you must have been pretty special that, that you, you got, out of everyone they they didn't watch, you were one of the few that they did take their time to actually have a look at. Because, as you said, Jamie, I think it was just accepted in the nineties. He was just he was just phenomenal, and he was just different different kettle of fish, to be honest. And it is a shame that for whatever reason he could never really give it up by the end. You know, I, I'm a big fan of Joe Calzaghe, but 
you know, Kazagi, um Roy Jones at that that stage wasn't the Roy Jones that um, no. that he actually was, you know, and, and he he couldn't ever give up boxing for. I, I I'm pretty sure he's he'll, he'll announce a fight later this year. To yeah. be honest, because he just he just doesn't want to give it up. And um, but no, the '90s version of Roy Jones was a very very special talent. So it's interesting well, because. So yeah, it was interesting because I saw an article on Twitter saying, um, well, I've seen a lot of people throughout, you know, even guys I know, they've always brought the argument up saying that, okay, like Charlie said, friends of mine who aren't into boxing that much. And they've always said to me, who did Roy Jones fight? Who did Roy Jones fight? But in 1993, the top 10 middleweight rankings, um, they had guys like Julia Jackson, Joe McClellan, Roy Jones, Tate, uh, Hopkins was in there, uh, Reggie Johnson. And I remember uh, Mike McCollum as well. Out of the 10, Roy had beaten fa- uh, James Tony's up. Roy had beaten five of those guys in the top 10. Yeah. Up until that point in his prime. So it makes you think, okay, he did what he did at middleweight. Then to go up again and beat um, uh, Virgil Hill at light heavyweight. And that Virgil Hill knockout was special. It was like, uh, for those who haven't seen it, body shot, body shot knockout. Yeah. It was like... Yeah. Literally folded in in half. <laughs> it was like a 12 gauge shotgun going off. Like a, it's like he's a whip yeah. and left hook to the body and... Even George Foreman's reaction to that fight and knockout as well. Um, yeah, I think I don't think we'll see. You know, the same way people say we won't see another Ali, we won't see another Mike Tyson, we won't see another Roy Jones, and I don't think he can pass on that type of knowledge to Mister Eubank Junior as well. Yeah, I um, definitely agree. <laughs> it's a I, point um, I had to bring up. I'm gonna dive into my favorite fight, and. I went for one that's a little bit different. So it's not necessarily one that was kind of happened during my lifetime, Mm -hmm. but I kind of, obviously people that know me and have read my stuff know that I like to go back throughout history and look at old fighters and old fights. And I've watched loads and I've watched ones live that have excited me or made me feel a certain way. But when I went back and read about this rivalry and watched this fight, it captured me differently differently when I watched it um, and it was the Bobby Shakun and uh, Bazooka Lemon four mm. fight um, December 11th 1982 and it was kind of reading the backstory first that really impacted the watch of the fight for me um, so going into it um, Lemon had won the first fight um, there was a draw in the second and Shakun had won the third one um, so it was kind of the perfect setup for the four fight obviously they were one apiece with a draw um, so this one would decide, you know, superior. Um, and going into it, they hated each other. They talked trash in the in the press conferences um, and in the pre-fight interviews. Um, there was a rivalry kind of, I talked about in an article that I wrote about the fight, where kind of Mexican and Mexican-Americans really hated each other. It was kind of similar with De La Hoya and Chavez in the 90s, where they um, and Mexicans didn't feel that Mexican Americans were kind of like true to Mexico, um, and they were more American than they were Mexican. Um, so there was that kind of side to the rivalry. And then prior to that fight happening, Shakun had been in loads of wars, and his wife wanted him to get out of boxing, um, and she pleaded and pleaded, and he just couldn't do it. Um, so she actually sadly ended up taking her life because she couldn't live with it. Um, and Bobby kind of still kind of in shock and in in kind of not knowing what to do, continued to fight and kind of pledged that he would win another world title to kind of honour her. Um, and then the fourth fight ended up happening between him and Lemon. Um, Lemon had gone on to win a world title and this time it was going to be for a world title. It was their first fight out of the four fights. So it was actually for a world title. Um, and Lemon came out and, you know, he was he had the nickname Bazooka for a reason. That left hand was dangerous and he came out and he was peppering him with a jab and he was just kept him at the on his reach. Um, and he dropped him in the third when he was off balance and it just kind of seemed like, right, this isn't going, this isn't, Shakun isn't getting that dream fight to honour his wife that he's going to get. He was cut in the fourth and it just seemed like, right, this is, this is, this is a bit of a horror story almost. Um and then as the fight wore on, Shakun started started having more success and he started to take over and he started gathering momentum and he was kind of reducing the deficit and moving back into the fight. And then in the 10th, he gets dropped again with a big looping shot and it's like, ah, oh, there you go, that's his hopes gone again. But he jumps up and kind of clearly with 
the thoughts of losing his wife and everything on his mind just gives it his everything in those last four rounds. And he just puts absolutely everything into it. And the back and forth fight, I mean, it's just... You see these clips of Gatty Ward and Barrera Morales. I mean, it's like this for 15 rounds. Um, and then in the final round with um, Lemon winning on the cards and Shakun not going to achieve his dream um, or fulfil his promise, he drops Lemon for the first time in the four-fight series, um, which in the last dying seconds, Lemon somehow gets to his feet, even though he's just completely gone. Um, and the fight ends and Shakun gets his win and honours his wife. Um, and he wouldn't have won without that knockdown in the final 10 seconds. So when you know that as well, and it would have been a draw, that kind of adds to the adds to the meaning of the fight. Um, and then even reading the backstory afterwards, I mean, Shakun went on to have a, like, a really troubled life after that. He developed dementia from boxing. Um, he lost his son in like gang warfare, so things like that. So reading the backstory really kind of made me felt like that fight was almost personal to me. Um, have any of you guys seen that fight? Um, I've seen clips of the fight, but I haven't really seen the whole fight from uh, start to end. Yeah, Charlie, have you seen it? I haven't, but the, the, the biggest compliment I can give it is you've sold it to me and I want to go and watch yeah. <laughs> all three fights now, to be honest, because I'm invested. So I'm, yeah, I'm, I'll, it's... I'll make sure to go and watch them for definite. I um, honestly encourage everyone to do it because it's on YouTube um, and it is just the best fight. And now that you've got a big backstory from me as well, you'll kind of understand why certain parts of it are more meaningful than just your average kind of fight. Mm -hmm. um, but I was kind of to, to kind of extending it when you guys kind of talked about things in your lifetime. Yeah, yeah, a yeah. Favorite, a favorite fight that stands out for me um, as a young teenager, I was a massive Darren Barker fan. And we went on a weekend away as a family. I can't remember where it was. Um, but I remember getting up at four in the morning to watch him beat um, Daniel Gill. And I remember that that was a that was a really good fight where Barker got talked up before the fight that he was gonna he was gonna outbox him and he was gonna use use the skills that he had, but he didn't. He just threw it out the window and kind of just put everything into it. Um, Charlie, do you remember that fight? I do. I was also a massive Darren Barker fan, um, a fan boy, some would say. I was in um, I was at V Festival at the time as a young 20, 21 year old. And uh, so I didn't see the fight live. I remember rushing home on the Sunday or the Monday whenever the festival finished um, and had it on Sky Record. I hadn't, hadn't checked the result. I mean, there was no, we didn't, my phone battery had died on the Friday of the festival. So there was no worry about that. Got straight on, watched it and was just, I mean, the body shot that, that, nearly took him out oh, yeah. you know just I don't know how he how he stood up to it anyway but it was probably I think I think I've actually tweeted this to Darren Barker before it's probably my favourite um, my favourite British uh, world title win in a long yeah. time it was I was I was absolutely buzzing for it and um, yeah and uh, it was a shame it was a shame what happened afterwards obviously with Sturm and stuff, but mm. he was so sort of injury prone Barker. And, and I think he knew, yeah. I think he knew that it was, it was over anyway and to, to win it and, and his backstory of, you know, his brother stuff. And he yeah. always says he won it for his brother. It's, um, I'm real, I was really chuffed that he won it. Yeah. I think a lot of people talk about, you know, his brother being the reason he got up. I do actually think what you mentioned, like what happened with the Stern thing. I think part of that's what got him up because he realised he would have his body would have been through a lot of pain in that camp. And I think he would have realised this is really kind of my last shot to actually win a world title. Yeah. Um and I can't put my body through it much longer, so if it's now or never. And you can see the way the way he grimaces and like he kicks his feet into the, the canvas. Mm. Um you don't usually see that, but he proper kicks his feet and kind of grimace. Um Right, so I think we covered what our favourite fights are. Um, we're going to move into our question of the week segment. Um, thank you to people that sent questions in. Um, we encourage you, if for people listening on YouTube, um, leave it in the comment section. We had a couple of comments on the last video, so we appreciate that. Um, but feel free to leave your comments in there. We'll look through them and we'll answer them. Um, 
or even if you want to suggest topics for us to write about in the neutral corner as well, we'd be happy to oblige with that. Um, so this week's question is relevant to something happened during the week. Um, Charlie Edwards, previously signed with Matcham and previously the holder of the WBC flyweight title, has um, has jumped ship to Frank Warren. Um, I wanted to get your guys' thoughts on that as, from the question of the week. Um, I'm going to quickly give what I kind of thought of it. Um, I felt like it was a little bit, I don't usually say this, but I felt some of the things he said might have been a little bit harsh on Hearn. And it's very rare that I would say that. Um, but Hearn delivered him a world title shot in his ninth fight um, against Casemiro, albeit he was too premature for it, but he he still got in the fight and he was willing enough to take it. Um, he got another one in his 15th um, and he got in these opportunities. And then against Martinez, after he lost, it kind of, he wanted to move up because he said of the weight cut. And obviously they said you can be fight a final eliminator against Rung Versai, um and the winner gets Estrada. And I think Edwards obviously does want no part of that, which is for good reason. Um, but I think I think Eddie Hearn's kind of almost a little bit like, well, fuck you then, because I don't really need you. I think the only purpose Edwards served is a Yafai fight. I think that's the only reason Hearn would want him, because otherwise I don't see him winning a title at Super Flyweight. And there's even talk of him going straight up to Bantam because he struggled that much mm. to make Flyweight. I mean, in a division where Inoue's top of the tree, there's no chance of you of you winning anything anyway. Um, Charlie, what did you make of the move? And do you feel it's a little bit odd as well? Yeah, I was really surprised about it. I, I, I see it. He was like doing an online press conference with um, yeah. Frank Warren. I was really surprised. Um, I don't know. I, I don't know. As you say, he's he wants nothing to do with that weight anymore. I mean, I, I did find it quite funny. Like, even when they gave his title back um, after... Uh, the Martinez defeat, and then he sort of stepped away from it. I think he and he didn't want the rematch. He knew, you know, he was he knew he was done there. He knew there was there was no point chasing that anymore. And um, I, I didn't see him leaving Hearn just yet, as you say with the Yafai fight. I thought that was always there. I thought it made sense, but once Yafai lost the title, maybe it makes a, a bit less sense. Um, Sonny Edwards was saying on on Twitter this week that or. Actually, I think Charlie said it about that it makes sense for them both to be at the same, uh, in the same stable and, and, and under the same pro- promotion and all of this because, um, you know, they're brothers and it sells more. I'm, I'm not sure if that's true. You know, Liam Smith always done all right away from his brothers. And I don't know. I'm, I'm not, uh, I don't think there was much left for Charlie at, at Matchroom anyway. I don't think they could have done much more for him. And I think he'll begin to get beat quite regularly in, in terms of like, if he really does see himself at world level, I don't really see him at world level. I thought, again, it's a good story that he had, you know, with his mum and stuff. Um, I've always thought Sonny was a little bit better than him, but they both in the past talked about that they would take the fight with one another. Um, I don't know if that's true. I don't know if that's them selling it, but it is interesting that they talk about you know brothers and the same the same promotion, and they mention it a lot. And for them to have said if the money was right, we'd fight. I mean, Frank Warren would be all over that, you know. Um, yeah, and may, maybe maybe that's the plan. Maybe there there really is a a, a strange plan. But it, it the the rumors about him jumping up two weights don't surprise me because he by all accounts, was really, really struggling down there. But then I don't know if that, if maybe he's over, he's overselling how much he struggled because of how badly Martin has beat him and how badly he would have got beat as well, you know, otherwise. Um, I think, I, I, I do, I do sometimes like when people leave Matchroom though and sort of, I like when Warren, I left, like when Warren left, left Matchroom and went to do something else and, when he went back again, I sort of thought, well, what was the point? What I don't get the move, to be honest. So I do like I do like that he's trying something else. Um, and there's only really Frank Warren in this country that you can go to if you're not with Hearn, um, sort of. Um, so, yeah, it'll be interesting. It'll be interesting to see what Warren does with him. 
My prediction is not very much, to be honest. I, I don't see it. It wouldn't surprise me if when when boxing's back, if Frank Warren starts talking about the your fire fight, that wouldn't surprise me if they do start calling your fire out. But other than that, I, I don't I don't know what really I, nothing about Charlie Edwards' career at the minute excites me. Of oh, he can sort of do this or do that. So the move itself is interesting because it is just always interesting when when they sort of cross promotions and stuff. But and because his brother's there and whatnot. But in terms of do I think he's gonna now make a big step that he couldn't make at Matchroom? No, not really. Yeah, you kind of um, you what you alluded to with kind of the leaving Matchroom. Sometimes it kind of we all like it. I agree with that, and like you said with Warrington, he he actually left, and it and he kind of did the right thing. He got the final eliminator, beat Selby, beat Frampton, and now he's in a really strong position as one of Britain's best. But with Edwards, it's almost like why? Um, because the the best, I don't think he beats any champion from super flyweight or bantamweight. No, I mean, it- and the and the best option for him was Yafai. And if Yafai is still at Matchroom, going to Warren. You're just going to go to Warren and make all these call outs. It's not going to happen because the promotional beef. Um, I just, I, I honestly think Eddie Hearn said, I want you to fight your fight. And that's kind of my plan for you. And then if that's not it, then you can go elsewhere. Um, and I think that's it because from, from other than your fight, what is there apart from getting yourself in a mandatory position and losing to another champion? Usman, do you, can you, can you envisage a plan for? Um, Charlie Edwards. Yeah, actually, with Charlie Edwards, I feel like the um, move to Queensbury, it makes sense in the, uh, from a promotional point of view, um, simply because his brother fights for Warren as well. I mean, I don't know if Warren wants to build them up as like the UK's arms or some Charlos or whatever, but um, I've noticed with um, Queensbury and Frank Warren, he always has some sort of affiliation with the WBO. Um, even like, you know, there's talk of Liam Williams fighting Demetrius Andrade for the WBO. Uh, even Anthony Yard had that silly WBO European title, whatever it was. And when I look through the bantamweight, um, sorry, the super flyweight rankings right now, if Edwards was to stay on at that weight, which is, you know, it's, it's a hard task for him. But I look to the WBO champion of the super fly division, uh, Kazu- Kazuto Ioka. And out of, the, out of the champions in the division, I feel like Ioka is the most beatable. You know, there's no, there's no chance... Um, Edward would be able to beat Gonzalez, Estrada, and Gahas. Um So yeah, maybe if Warren has a world title shot for him down the line, if Charlie wishes to stay at Superfly, then Yoke is the answer because there's no way he'll be able to stand with the guys at Bantamweight. You know, your new A's, like you said, the new A's, Ubali's, Casemiro's. And even when you look to the Superman Bantamweight division, you've got the Uzbeks, uh, Ahmad Aliyev, and Ray Vargas, and Navarrete. All the names I've mentioned are because... Going by what Martinez did to him, even though it was, um, you know, it should have been a Martinez win, I feel. Um, I do feel like the same fighters were just, like Charlie said before, they'll just beat him and he will become beatable. So unless there's, you know, Hunt, uh, sorry, Warren wants to go down the traditional WBO route and fight someone like Ioka, uh, or like you guys said, the Yafai fight, which still sells itself, um, I don't think he'll be able to achieve much as a world champion. That's just my take on it. Yeah, the, the the thing, the point I will add about the Ioka fight, um, even though I still think Ioka would be in, um, Ioka is going to have to fight um, Kosi Tananka um, from the division below. He's a three weight world champion already. He's looking to become a fourth um, because he was the WBO champion at flyweight. Um, you know, the WBO have that rule where you're instantly mandatory if you move up. Um, so he'll be made mandatory and them two will have to fight first. And I think by the time Edwards gets to that, he'll probably have to fight um, Tananka. And I think he, he yeah, would yeah. beat Edwards. Um, so, yeah, that's why I just can't see uh, can't see where this move is going. Um, right, guys, I think we've covered everything. It's been another good episode. Did you guys enjoy it? Yeah, I loved it. <laughs> yeah, good fun. Good stuff. Um, I want to thank you all for joining us again. Like I mentioned earlier, this will be available on YouTube and Podbean. Um, 
to plug it again, Podbean is a really easy to use app. Um, it's free to download and it's good to listen to when you're on the way to work or out on your exercise and things like that. Um, but if you're using YouTube, please subscribe to the channel and use the notifications and things like that to get notified when we upload. Um, comment your questions of the week. If there's anything you want to hear us talk about, even if it's one of our topic sessions, let us know and we'll consider it and we'll, and we'll bring it to the panel. Um, um, but other than that, we'll see you in the next two weeks and thank you guys for joining me.